All right, chapter two is about malware and social engineering. I have a couple projects for this one, which we'll get to. All right. Malware. Okay, malware or software, malicious software, enters our computer, it says, without the owner's knowledge or consent. Well, sometimes I would say, some, I would say some people actually installing it, install it, I mean, they have to click the button. So they, they know what's happened, they just might not know the extent of what it's going to do to their computer. Okay? They could damage, they could be annoying. A uh, prime example of this is, uh, there was one called the Butterfly Screensaver. A lot of people have had it. It comes from Gain Publishing. It's free. Download, it's, it's also like the, the smileys, and stuff. they're all free. People are like, but it was free. Okay, how could these companies develop something and provide it for free? Is that, are we, we all in the money of the market doing stuff for free? No. They want to get something out of it. And by installing that, you're getting 47 other tools as well. Uh, Kazaa, you all remember Kazaa? File sharing tool that was out there? At one point, I think Kazaa, they said, had like 114 pieces of malware built into it. Isn't that crazy? A lot of stuff. Okay. Primary objectives could be to infect the system. Now, do they infect our system just to kill it? No, they're normally infected to the point where we have to buy something. Maybe we're getting different advertisements. We're getting links to come up. Uh, quite a few of them. Like you'll be searching for AT&T and you get an ad for Singular or something like that. It would cause redirections and stuff like that. Sometimes they conceal their purpose. Sometimes they make a profit. Lots of people making money off this stuff. All right. All right. Now where this spreads, we could have viruses. Okay. Viruses are a big deal now. There's always new ones. It says malicious computer code that reproduces itself on the same computer. Okay. They can affect many different ways. Okay. Could be appending itself to files. Could be moves, you know, first bytes in computer code. There could replace different instructions in computer code. So there's a bunch of different ways they could be out there, okay? There's the Swiss cheese infection. They inject themselves into executable code. The original code is transferred somewhere else, okay? And people don't see it, okay? Could, virus could be split into different pieces, okay? It could start at the beginning of the fall so they don't go after it. So there's all kinds of different ways, okay? When it's launched, it says the virus could replicate itself by spreading to another file on the same computer or spreading to another computer even, okay? It could activate its malicious payload. Does it always activate it right away? No. It could activate years later. The Melissa virus took years to activate. There's just all kinds of them took years. What's the latest one that begin with the F? Flame. Flame. They say flame has actually been out there for years and years. But it's been dormant this whole time. So one of the bad things about the flame virus was flame infected computers, but it's been sitting there infected for so long, our antivirus thought it was normal. Then they finally start activating it. It's like I mentioned, it could be me walking through this building every day for a year. It's normal now for Ken to be walking through this building. Now all of a sudden I start doing something malicious. Okay? They could display messages or they could delete files. They could do all kinds of stuff. Yeah, you know, the I Love You virus. Was that very malicious? Anyone remember the I Love You virus? Basically it went through an email, it says I love you. And you clicked on it, and it basically read your address book and sent a message to all those people saying you love them. And I had a customer of mine at the point, uh, Teller Valve Technologies out on Council Road in Oklahoma City. And they got infected. And they kept getting infected over and over. It's like, dude, nobody loves you. Get over it. I mean, it was. <laughs> but the nice thing about the I love you virus, it was specific files in specific locations. So what I did, I just wrote them a batch file. And put it on their desktops. So, okay, next time you get infected, which I knew, I just, just click this and I go clean it all off. But it kept getting infected over and over. Okay. A lot of people, it, it would go out and delete JPEGs. Anybody that's a potential camera at that time frame would all save the JPEGs. Yeah. So we lost thousands of pictures. Oh, wow. Nice. Because, and it would also, if, if it, they had drives mapped, right. not only would it remove them off the C, it would go off the mapping. Through to the map drives, hmm. that was there, at least we had backups. Yeah. So we could get those pictures back, but the ones on, that weren't on the server were gone. Nice. All right, some of the things they could do is cause a computer to repeatedly crash, that has happened. 
erase files, we just talked about that, or reformat a drive, turn off security settings, a lot of stuff they could do, okay? Here's an annoying message. I think I speak for every pot smoker in North America when I say legalize marijuana, okay? Wow. All right, is that really malicious? Well, not really hurting anything, but it's annoying. I mean, you know, if it happens over and over and over, so, all right. So this virus cannot automatically spread to another computer. Now, some can. Worms can. Viruses not necessarily can, but, okay. Viruses, they do rely on someone to spread them. It can be attached to files. It can be attached to emails. It could be done all kinds of different ways, okay. All right. It could be a program. It could be a macrovirus, the word macrovirus. That's why all the macros are disabled now. It could be a resident virus. It says, Virus infected files opened by user or the operating system itself. Could load automatically. Does anyone got any programs that load automatically when you turn your machine on? We all do. We have our antivirus load. We have all kinds. You know, I can look at this machine right here. Look at all this stuff. Well, I got Dropbox loaded in Google Drive because I'm putting files there. But I have my speaker. I have antivirus. I have... Uh, Intel Management Security Suite, I have Deep Freeze, I have Virtual Machines, I have all this stuff running when I turn my machine on. What happens if one of those gets infected? Oh, then we got a problem, okay? Could be a boot sector. Affects the master boot sector of the drive. That way, whenever the machine comes on, it's automatically infected, okay? All right? Could be a companion. This is add malicious copycat program to an operating system. Um, I like the one that was a couple years ago now. The one was the Java Bear. It says, oh, if you have this file on your machine, you must delete it. It's malicious. So people are deleting it. But it wasn't malicious. It wasn't a virus. <laughs> it was just, and what was happening, I had clients, am I deleting it? I'm like, why did you delete it? Because it said to. It's not a virus. <laughs> it was just an email that got spread that said, this is a malicious program. It's not a malicious program. Leave the darn thing alone. So I had to go out and fix them because it deleted a component of Java, and then a lot of stuff wouldn't start working. So. Worms, another malicious program. It says exploits application or operating system. Now, this one can actually do it by itself. Okay? Sends copies of itself to other network devices. The NIMDA virus. Some of you might have heard of the NIMDA virus. That one was tough. That one was spread via email. It was spread through file shares. It was actually a virus and a worm built into one. Now, I remember I... Uh, um, oh, Lynn, what was her name? Lynn something. I can't remember her last name now, but she ran an estate company. Like, you know, when people want to sell their estates, she would do the appraising and the auctioning and all that. Well, she got infected. Her, her office did. And it was pretty tough to get rid of it. And really the only way to get rid of it was you had to disconnect the network, clean all the machines, and then you were fine. Because if you would clean one, but it was still connected to the network, it would keep getting infected. I remember I went out there once, and I spent hours cleaning the machines. I wasn't done, but I had to come back the next day. Well, she came in that night, had to get some work done, reconnected the network, and turned the machines back on. So all the work I had just done was gone. I was like, oh, you're killing me. All right. They could consume resources. They could leave stuff behind. Okay. They could delete files. They could do all kinds of stuff. Okay. All right. The differences between them, basically viruses, they normally have to be executed. Worms execute on themselves. That's the main difference, okay? They say viruses can't be remote controlled. I don't really know about that. I would say they kind of can. I know they're more than worms, but... All right, Trojans. Programs that does something other than what's advertised. I would say that's your butterfly screensaver. You're downloading a screensaver, yet it's doing something else as well. It's normally executable. Right. Sometimes appear as data. Okay, you download a free calendar program. There you go. Who would write a calendar program for free? Nobody. Okay, they get something out of it. Then it scans for credit card numbers. It could transmit through a network. All kinds of different stuff. Root kits is a software tool is installed by hackers to hide what they're doing. Pretty much to hide malicious software. Okay. They can hide your logs, delete your logs. They could alter logs. They could alter operating system files. They could do all kinds of stuff to it. Okay. They can be checked with the antivirus software as well. Sometimes they're hard because normally if they install before the OS, they're harder to find. Okay. It can be difficult. It must be erased. Sometimes you must reload. 
reformat your hard drive, so that could be tough. Lots of problems. Wait for something to happen. Maybe I got one installed. This is the moment Ken Dewey's name is removed from the organizational list. Kill the system. Could be. Trigger by a specific event, then does something. Okay. There's a few of those you've heard about those on the news out there. Difficult to detect before the trigger, or it could be a backdoor. Maybe someone wrote something, a piece of software that's going to let someone in. All right. Oh, and they say the backdoors is a common practice by developers. I wrote software with backdoors on it, not to be malicious, but just so I could go in and fix problems. Okay, it's really not a good thing to do, though. Okay, here we go. Now we got designed to profit. Okay, we have botnets. Maybe that's a bunch of zombie machines out there that we can hire to infect or do other things for us. Spyware, watch what we're doing. Adware could pop up ads for us. Keyloggers could actually capture what we're doing, all kinds of different stuff out there, okay? Now, our botnets, basically, computers are infected. They can do all kinds of stuff. There's groups of zombies or computers that are infected called a botnet, okay? Okay. All right, advantages, okay, they operate in the background. People don't know they're happening. That Ghost X's video I showed, he was actually installing a botnet on the machine so they can control it later. If you get a chance to watch that video, it's kind of cool, Okay. All right, uses of it for spam, spreading malware, attacking IRC networks, denying services, all kinds of stuff, okay? Spyware, used for advertising, collecting personal information, changing computer configurations, just all kinds of stuff they do without your consent, okay? If I'm going to get rid of this kind of stuff, spyware and malware, what am I going to use, anybody? Recommendations? Malware bytes is a good one. I'm going to go... Malwarebytes org, isn't it? Yes. Malwarebytes.org, really good one. The free version works great. I love it. So Malwarebytes is good. Um, what's the one you can boot to a CD-ROM? Uh, Bitdefender. Bitdefender, you can actually make a bootable disk with it on it. You can boot to it, then it'll go clean your software. Uh, I was talking to my wife uh, this last weekend. See if you get a come up with the same idea I did. She said they're having a problem at Tinker Air Force Base. Machines are booting slow. I mean, excessively slow. Two to three hours to boot up. I mean, she actually, you know, last week she was telling me, yeah, she literally sat there for almost three hours. She first got there before a machine could boot up. I'm like, wow. So, I mean, it's kind of wasting her day because she's supposed to fix so many problems a day. Okay. So she's like, you know, and so I was asking, what do you do to fix it? Because, well, there's a problem with some files, something on the Tinker network. I don't know what it is. Files are getting corrupted. So what they do is they let the machine boot up. Machine boot, they go in, they turn off this one service for this, whatever they're doing. I don't know what the software is. Turn off this service. They go delete the files in question, turn the service back on, then the files repopulate and they're fine. Fixes it every time. So how am I going to fix that? Anybody? Any ideas? They, I mean, they've been fixing it that way for years. Letting it boot up, turning off the service, deleting the files, turning the service back on, and then we're fixed. Well, you can, you can kill the service and delete it while you're online, while it's on already. Right, but, what, but if it takes three hours to get on, how do you... Well, then you do it from the CD or whatever. Okay. I, said, I asked you, I said, so... But you guys got a software program that you reset passwords with. Oh, yeah. So how does that software work? Well, we boot to the CD-ROM, and we reset the password. I said, so you're not really running Windows. I said, why don't you use that software, go to the command prompt, and delete that file in question? She says, you can do that? It says, yeah, because you're not booting to Windows. You're booting to your CD-ROM. That file's not in use. Because all they were doing was they were turning off their service, deleting the files, turning on the service. The whole point was you had to get the service turned on. But if you're not booting the Windows, the service isn't running. So she's like, there's no way that'll work. She messaged me last night. She goes, you are a lifesaver. Because she, she did it twice yesterday alone. She goes, it is amazing. I boot to that disk, go to the command prompt, change it to the directory, delete the file, fixed it instantly. So I... You know, people don't think of that stuff. I mean, what's funny was the entire help desk does it the other way. They literally say, oh, yeah, you just got to wait three hours for it to boot up. I'm like, wow. What if somebody has a problem for those three hours? The, 
Well, I mean, there's more people. I mean, the this is quite a few people. But if you happen to get assigned that ticket, you're literally sitting there for three hours while that system boots up. And it's like crazy. So now she's fixing in about five minutes. She sure has to do job security. <laughs> yeah. So I told her, I said, so how many people have you told about this so far? She says, nobody. <laughs> yeah. Because I think it's kind of like a contest who can fix the most stuff the quickest. I said, you need to share that because that's really something easy. So I don't know what the software they're running is. But the moment I heard you turn the service off, you delete the files, turn the service on, I mean, that's a prime candidate for something like that. So. Yeah, my question is, why do they allow it to reoccur? Is this a service or something that they're running that they have to have? Yeah, I don't know exactly what it is. It's something. Right, why does it get? But I've seen, I've seen the problem happen with Windows updates. Sometimes Windows updates will not work. It fails. So you, turn, you stop the update service, you go into the software distribution folder and delete it. Turn it back on and fix it. That's why I told her to do that. Because I, I asked her, is it the software update service? No. It's some other weird, I don't know. It's something they do. I don't, whatever it is, I said, so you literally just delete the files and they rebuild themselves automatically. I said, oh, yeah, do this. She's like, oh, my God, you don't know how much time this has saved me. Because she has to solve so many problems a day. Then she really do whatever she wants for the rest of the day. So she's studying for Security Plus. She's studying for these tests. So, so it cannot get. But you know, there's all kinds of problems with software out there. Okay, you may play shortcuts on your machine. You may hijack your home page. You know, a lot of places do that. You install something, all of a sudden your home page is now pointing to whatever, something like that. What is it? Yeah, pornography. Yes. Okay, increasing in pop-ups, you could do all kinds of stuff. Okay, and I lost my, there it is. All right. Here are just some of the stuff. They can automatically download software, passive tracking. They can do all kinds of stuff. Okay, adware. Delivers advertising content. Okay. Now, I got an iPhone, and I download some free apps. Okay. A lot of times the free apps have ads in them. So is that really adware? Not really. It's something I'm doing. I'm downloading and I know it has ads in there. But I was reading an article about the number one misuse of smart devices. And naturally, I have to read it. How many of you th that have phones that can download apps? You can't on Blackberry, can you? Yes. Do you have any? You have apps for yours? Apps. I do. What, all five of them? There's, there's, like, <laughs> there's like 10 apps. There's like 10 of them? Wow, they've gone up. Okay. But. The, the point was, okay, so, so some of us download apps for our phones. Do we mainly download the free ones? We don't want to pay for those things, do we? We want the free ones. The guy's article, which makes total sense when you hear it, he says, why? He says, we're willing to go to a restaurant and pay two bucks for a soda that we drink in 30 minutes instead of paying 99 cents for an app that we might actually be able to use. On a phone that you paid 600 Right. His point was... Pay a little bit of money for some of these apps. So what if it costs five bucks? If you use it and it has functionality, isn't it better than the soda you just bought and drank at lunchtime and it's over with? Right. Makes sense. Well, some of that stuff, you pay 99 cents, you don't get all the ads. And right, exactly. Like you so pay 99 cents, you don't get the ads, you don't get the junk. So <laughs> I'm trying to use that mindset now. Now, a lot of them, I will download the free one to see if I want it, and then I download the paid version, the 99 cent version. But, you know, I'm just like, you know, you're drinking a soda right now, you paid a buck and a quarter for it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and it's gone. It's gone in an hour. You know, I, we all do that. I'll stop at a fast food restaurant this week, spend five bucks on something that two hours later will be gone. Oh, uh, there's an article on the news, kind of funny. They fit, they, you know how to eat Chinese food? Here's how you eat Chinese food. You go to eat Chinese food, eat until you're full. Wait 30 minutes, then go finish it. Or eat the rest. <laughs> Isn't that how it happens? <laughs> but the point is, you know, if you're going to spend a, 99 cents is nothing. So if you think of it in that way, it's like, wow, it's, this is cheaper than a soda. We went out to rib crib the other night, but what, two bucks on your tea? Something like that? 99 cents app, you can still be using it. So if you try to think of it that way, it's like, wow. And you actually find apps that are quite usable that way. So I've been trying to think of it that way. Okay, but Adware could pop up browser windows. That's pretty much what that one did at the, I told you that school's computer was popping up pornography. Ugh, 
Okay. They could also track your online activity, see what you're doing, and giving you specific ads for that. Okay. Downside of AdWords to users. May display objectionable content. Yep. Did you know that sex and pornography is the number one thing searched on the Internet? It's not certain. No one does it. No one will ever admit to it. <laughs> you know what would be awesome? If you could actually track what's being searched or surfed in a hotel. Yeah. I mean, it has to be in the 90 percentile. <laughs> like yeah, there's two of them. And they do massive amounts of surfing. Well, there was a, a study I read that said that the number one state for, uh, by popular, let's see, what was it? Per capita. The highest percentage right. of people in a state that have memberships or uh, accesses adult websites yeah. was Utah. Utah. The number one state for pornography is Utah. Utah. Because wow. there's nothing out there. <laughs> well, those Mormons are pretty <laughs> Oh, the Mormons are good. Yeah. Well, they got 12 wives. You know, they need some more. So, uh, <laughs> That's wild. All right. But it could have pop-ups. Okay. It could slow our computer down. And what gets me is some, you know, you know that super anti-spyware, whatever you could buy, that you know, the pop-up people buy. Uh, and I mentioned the other class, the whole before Linda and after Linda thing. Well, that Linda, she actually bought it. Then when she got her computer rebuilt, she bought it again. I'm like, you're the only person I've ever known who bought it twice. It's like crazy. What happens is once they get you to buy it, then they're like, all right, they're, they're already gullible. They're already willing to spend some cash. Now we're going to offer the pro version. <laughs> yes, and they buy it again. Twice. You did it twice? It's crazy. Yeah, they spent, what, $200 or $300, isn't it? Yeah. But I get so many people contacting me, like, yeah, I paid for it. I'm like, why? Because it said I had to. Okay, fine. You have to pay me 500 bucks. <laughs> yeah, I don't ever know. Do you know anybody that, that, that <laughs> has that secure identity, the, the guy that shows up LifeLock? on TV? I had that. I had that for years. Did you? Okay. I actually liked LifeLock because when I signed up for it, see, my niece was living with me for a while. Then she moved back to Connecticut. Right after that happened, I went to get a copy of my credit report. And you know how you ever go to annualcreditreport.com, you got to put in like your name and an address, and they ask you something else like, have you ever owned a Ford something or other? Yeah. I could not verify my address. <laughs> it says my address was incorrect. I'm like, what do you mean I live here? Well, my address somehow got reset to Vernon, Connecticut, where my brother lives. And there was an application made for a credit card, which got denied at the same time. But LifeLock fixed all of it. I called them and said, hey, I can't get my credit report, blah, blah. And they're like, no problem. Take care of it. Done. So I was impressed that they did it. I don't have it now because all my, my bank includes it for free. My credit card companies all include it for free. So were well, you can say something, Brett? Okay. All right. Okay. But it's, it's just uh, – but I, I do like that service. It's decent. So I was actually giving a little talk about cybersecurity. I've done it a whole bunch of times, like at a, a luncheon, they want me to come speak, or I speak to students and stuff like that. Well, I was speaking to the Midwest City Chamber of Commerce. They have this leadership class that meets sometime during the year, and they wanted me to come speak one day. So I did, and I was speaking about my bank and how my bank does it and all this stuff and how they manage passwords and all this stuff. And I said, no, I'm pleased with my bank. I like the way they do it. Thank God. About six people in the audience were the VPs from my bank. <laughs> At the end of my lecture, they all come up handing me their cards. I'm like, oh, crap. So I said, we appreciated your comments. Because, I mean, I, I said stuff that I thought they should change. Okay? Like, here's something to think about. We all have banks and stuff like that online. You know the security questions? How do you answer them? Do you answer them correctly? You shouldn't answer them correctly. Because what are they asking you? Mother's maiden name. High school. I mean, what gets me is when they ask, like, your elementary school mascot. Dude, I don't have a clue. Okay. I'm too old. It. But don't answer them correctly. Answer them with something like chocolate milkshake. If you put chocolate milkshake to the answer to every question, you'll remember it. And if Brian back there was trying to break into my account, what's your mother's maiden name? Is he ever going to guess chocolate milkshake? Well, I mean, just something. Like peas. Yeah, just something that you can remember. 
Pick something that you can remember that you can use for all of them, and then you're never, ever going to know. I mean, you as the bad guy will never. I mentioned that to my bank because they have questions, elementary school mascot. And I'm like, I'm 50 or close to it at that point. I don't even know what elementary school. I, I moved all the time. I don't remember what the mascot was. And they're like, yes, but you have the ability to select other questions. Yeah, favorite color, favorite car. It changes all the time. Okay, pet's name. You know, so I don't particularly like those questions. But I mentioned, you know, putting the same thing. It says it's not a good idea to put the same thing in all of them. Yes, it is. If it's not the correct answer, it is. Yeah. So it was kind of funny. But they, but they approached me afterwards and said, yeah, we, we took your comments and we appreciate it. So, All right, key loggers could capture key strokes. Uh, oh, about three years ago, I did a look into the amount of spyware out there. And it was like 94% of all spyware has the ability to capture key strokes. They all don't do it but they could okay kind of scary stuff okay i use a uh, program called lastpass.com it's free lastpass.com if you don't i mean it's awesome with lastpass what you do it's a website which you know does anyone ever uh, tell your machine to remember passwords well i do sometimes because I'm, I'm logging into my machine so really you have to have my login to get it. But LastPass, you can tell to retrieve all that off your computer and don't save anymore, which is good. But LastPass, when you log into a website, it stores it, okay? And then what's cool about it is I never have to enter that pass. I enter the one password for LastPass, and I got a, like a 25-character password. It's very complicated. But once I log into that, and any time I go to a website, it remembers it. And if I go back to the website, it puts it in. Like, you know, recently the Twitter had the issue with passwords gotten reset. So if I go to Twitter to reset my password, LastPass pops up and says, oh, it's asking for a new password. Would you like me to generate one? So I generated a 14-digit totally random password and told it to save it. Then whenever I go back to Twitter, I don't have to put it in because it, it's a password that I don't even know. Now I can go into the system and find it. And even like here in this classroom, I could literally log into LastPass right now in this classroom and still get to all my websites. Just click the Amazon, click all the different ones that will have all my information. But if you don't have a service like that, I recommend getting it. And another one I have, which I'll show it to you. I don't want to go to my last pass because you can see some of the stuff in there. But this one, I'll, I have one you can see in here. Uh, there's another one, Mamengo.com, which I use as well. I've actually been using this one for years. Mamengo. Uh, don't remember. Let's get out of here. Go away. Sign in. Come on. There it goes. And this uses AES-256 encryption. I got a very long passphrase. And they tell you when you set it up, if you forget your passphrase, don't call them because they do not know what your stuff is. All right. So in here you can put all kinds of stuff. All right. Here's bike lock. Somewhere around Tinker Air Force Base, Midwest City, there's a bicycle locked up somewhere. And there's the combination. I literally have no clue where it is. So if you ever find a random bike in a lock, there it is. <laughs> but you can put everything in here. <laughs> but I, for the life of me, no, I, I don't. See, when I lived on Tinker before I retired, I rode a bicycle every single day. I mean, I lived on base. So I rode my bike to work, rode my bike home, rode to Rose State. Because I literally rode a bicycle every single day, rain, sleet, snow forever but then I get out of the military and I don't remember because I stopped riding bikes <laughs> I don't know where it is I might have left it in the shed somewhere I don't know but it was, that was my bike lock so if you ever find a bike lock somewhere that could be it but I recommend sites like this because nowadays there's we can't remember all of our stuff but what's cool about the LastPass website is that obviously that one big long phrase I have to know but as I'm going to other websites, I'm not entering the password. It's doing it. So if there is a key logger, guess what? It ain't getting nothing. So it's a really cool idea. So if you don't have it, I actually heard it on a tech forum. They were talking about it. It's called lastpass.com. You'll like it. It's the last password you ever remember. It's really cool. All right. 
All right, so key loggers can be hardware devices, can actually be plugged into our machine. I know I used in this, this, this computer system this whole week. And I used it a couple of weeks ago, and I used it a month ago. Do you think I have ever looked around the back of it and made sure there was no key logger? No, I didn't. Should I? Yes. Because, you know, Brian could have come up here and put a key logger and could be gathering all my stuff. But DEF CON two years ago, and they had a USB drive. Mm -hmm. And what it did is it moved the mouse one pixel. Oh, so the screen savers wouldn't activate? Every five minutes, so the screen saver wouldn't activate. Nice. And it didn't, that's all it did is just moved it one pixel. So that you came back 12 hours later, it's it only there. moved 12 or 24 pixels. Yeah. Not enough that most people would notice. But now, uh, I actually, something close to that, way back when the internet first started getting popular, they had these websites you could sign up for, and as long as you kept using them, they would get money. I wrote a Visual Basic app that did that, kept moving the stuff just little by little. And I think after running it for months, I got like 10 cents. So this ain't worth it. So I stopped it. But I wrote something that, you know, you go to a website, and as long as you're active, yeah, no, nah, it didn't work out so well. I didn't make much money on it. So. All right. But it can be inserted into computer on your keyboard. That can actually be software based now too. Okay. Here's a picture one. Could be a key logger, and you'll never know. You can't see them. Again, did I look at this machine? No. I don't even know. Can I even see the back of the machine easily? No. I. Well, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I can. There's so many wires. Hardware. Where do you get one of those things? Oh, very. Just go online. Type in USB key logger. Yeah. There's tons of them. But okay, I'm looking at the desk y'all are sitting at. I can't see the back of your computers, which means you can't either. I can come in at night if I'm the cleaning crew. I can stick a USB key logger on each one of these machines. Come in the next night, pick them all up. There you go. I just got the password. Very student working in this room. Uh, the expensive ones cost like 20 bucks. They're very cheap. It would be a lot easier than, uh, I mean, obviously installing software. Mm -hmm. Actually, let's, let's find one because I've seen them before. Okay, let's go to this wonderful website. If you've never used, seen it before, it's pretty handy. Google. <coughs> USB key logger. 8 meg USB key logger. Oh, this one's $49. So it stores the data locally, so you've got to go back and pick it up later? Right. Okay. But think about it. I'm the cleaning crew. I come in here and stick them on all the machines. The next night I pick them up. Yep, there it is. You can get a white one. You can get a black one. Yeah. Some stored on the device. Some, it's just one that was yeah, they have wireless ones you can get via Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. You can pick it up later. So, here's a four meg. Let's see if this one costs from Amazon. Oh, this one. Wow, seventy-four dollars. Oh, yeah, I know. Phantom Keystroke version 2, 1095. There we go. Check out time delay, caps lock. You, yeah, there you go. Yeah. Nice. There you go. 10 bucks. You got one. Okay. Yeah, there's a there's bunch of them out there. All right. And the logs, you can actually see what they're doing. When I was up in Tulsa, there was a, a girl doing research on keyboard dynamics. You know, she actually had us come, you know, she'd bring us a laptop, we'd have to type a phrase, but that wasn't capturing keystrokes, it was more about keystroke dynamics. But it's kind of cool, these can actually capture everything. It's, it's amazing, okay? All right, social engineering attacks relies on trusted nature of individuals, okay? Have I had to prove to any of you who I are, who I am? No. Did y'all have to prove to me who you are? No. And at the end of the week, they're going to send me a check for my time. You know, I've never, ever showed an ID to anybody at this school. Not once. Now I've gotten a couple checks from them. Just think about it. I could say my name. I mean, I'd be giving them my social security number. I could say, I'd give them a fake social security number. I could be giving you all a social security number. And you all could be getting charged taxes on my income. So, you know. We're too trusting nowadays is what the point is. Okay? I mentioned how Rose State, I can call security, and they'll just open doors for people. Not a problem. Way back when I first got hired, I think they did check my ID one time. 
but they don't. Okay, how about flattery? If I walk up to you, you know, some girl, and oh wow, you got beautiful hair today. Start having a conversation, you know, getting good graces with you. You're more apt to just give me more information, be nicer to me. Okay, you now it can happen. Conformity. You just people, you know. Oh, he seems to know what he's doing. I don't want to, you know, do it. Or be friendliness. Just be a friend. How easy is it? How easy is it to be friends with people? We got a security guard at Rose State, a little blonde girl about the size of my pinky. Okay. I, I've been talking to her for years. She's one. You know, she's one of the only ones that's been on there that long. Real sweet girl. She smokes though, so I give her a hard time every single time I see her smoking. But we have a rapport. She knows that whenever I see her, I'm going to give her a hard time about smoking. But, you know, we're friends. She doesn't ask me for an ID. She opens doors for me if I need it, you know. Now, other people, hopefully if you guys asked her to open the door, she wouldn't do it. So, but, you know, that can happen, okay? Do you, ever, you ever watch that show? Um, oh, what show? find someone that's gotten ripped off and then they go rip them off um, and then they, they make this big uh, uh, leverage. Oh, leverage. Yes, I've seen leverage. Yes, right. yes. And a lot of what they do in their show right, social is engineering. part of the scam is right. different ways to do social yeah. engineering. So it's pretty interesting. Yeah, leverage really good show. Again, it's a TV show. Yeah. But some of the stuff, I right. mean, it's easy. Especially the social engineering part. Yeah. They, they there was a guy at DEF CON like two years ago who had a short video of what he does. I mean, he says, you know, you can buy a UPS uniform for 25 bucks, and you can show up to a business with a package with UPS tape on it, and they're going to let you ride on in. No questions asked. Yeah, it, they do ha it does happen, okay? There was a, when I worked for customs, there was, this, there was a, a guy who was kind of infamous within customs because mm -hmm. uh, he had been an installer for a really long time, and he right. was like the boss installer, and he had kind of this attitude where he could go anywhere and do anything and no one ever I worked at a psychiatric hospital uh, and you really had to watch people would that have been how about y'all ever heard of Buffalo Wall Wings? Mm -hmm. Some of you heard of them? I was hired to install wireless in three locations in Oklahoma City. Okay? I just put in basically a Linksys router, secured it, and installed it for three different locations. And they paid me a monthly fee to maintain them. After about three years in one trouble call, in three years, I stopped billing them because it was, I felt bad. I was basically sending them a bill every month and I wasn't doing anything. But the one time I did get a trouble call was way up in a place that I'd never been to after the initial install. They called and said there was a problem with the wireless. I walked up in the middle of the afternoon, walked right into the back area, said, can someone open up the office? They opened up the office, let me in, I fixed the problem. They don't know me for Adam. They never asked who I was. I said, I'm here to fix your wireless. I tell you, if you walk into anyone, any place, and say, I'm here to fix your computer system, you're in. Because I'm at Walmart the day after Thanksgiving on Black Friday, and they right. stole all the cash. Oh, nice. At 4 o'clock in the morning, they got right in. They never did. They stole it all, huh? Wow. Because yeah. people are trusting, especially when it comes to computers. People are like, oh, my God. I don't know anything about computers, so if you do, I'm going to just let you right on in. <laughs> Should they have checked this? Yes. Uh, we uh, had students do a project oh, maybe six years ago now, a social engineering project at Rose State. We, uh, it was Eileen, my ex-wife's class. She assigned them to infiltrate the campus. The only one that knew about this was the president. Nobody else was aware of it. We had permission. Students walked up to, find, uh, to student affairs and said, hey, my name is Eileen Dewey, faculty, I lost my ID card, can I have another one? Student got an ID printed with my wife's faculty information with the student's picture. We had other people walk into the shredding area, they got let in there. We had some students walk into our enrollment management area, say, hey, I'm John from IT Services, I'm here to fix your computer, they let him right in the back. And they even said, hey, can you log in for me? And they logged in for him, they let him into the computer. Now. After that, they did actually call IT services and find out that it wasn't real. So it's kind of funny because then all of a sudden an email went to everybody, hey, there's an intruder on campus. And then shortly after that, <laughs> disregard. <laughs> and they, actually, a lot of people on campus got very upset because they weren't in the know. But the point is that if they were in the know, then they would have 
Nope. Not. They, they do that lockdown campus. Stranger danger. Stranger yeah, stranger danger. danger. <laughs> but uh, now I'll tell you what things did happen now. All IT services now have a badge. And they, they do check IDs more now than they used to. Well, I say they check it at all times. No, but they check IDs more. So some things did come of it. I keep asking the president if we can do it again. And he keeps saying, yes, it's a great idea. Let me check with the other people. And they're all like, well, we have too much critical information to have that happen on campus. The whole point is you need to do it to find out if that critical information is safe. But, oh, well, that's, oh, well. We do uh, what's called limited performance tests. Okay. And, uh, we do every year in different areas. We right. We do, we do things like, like that. It's kind of an ongoing surveillance right. type system. Nice. That's good. I mean, you need to do that, okay? All right, so social engineering says attackers will ask only small amounts of information from a bunch of different people or over a long period of time, okay? Your request needs to be believable. It says it pushes the envelope to get a little more each time. May smile, may ask for help. Kind of cool idea. True examples is one attacker called Human Resource Office asked for the Got names of asking got names of key employees. We had students call Hollywood Video, which we no longer have in Oklahoma City. We had a student, Ashley. She called Hollywood Video. This is like Blockbusters, if you know what I'm talking about. She called there and said, hey, this is Ashley from corporate. We're verifying your payroll. Could you please give me the employee social security numbers, please? Right over the phone, give out all the passwords, all the social security numbers. She didn't know them from anybody, from Adam. Um, it's, it's just... Scary what can happen. Um, now, on the good side of it, our, our head, ID guy now, head IT guy now is Brad Johnston. He used to work for Eateries Incorporated. They're in charge of macaroni grill, Garfields, that, those kind of restaurants. Well, when we did a, a penetration testing class, and a student was stalking him, was trying to get information about his work. So the student called Brad's work and say, hey, I'd like to talk to Brad Johnston. And they said, what's the extension? He's like, I don't know. Well, I'm sorry, sir. I can't provide any information about any employees. They don't acknowledge they work there. They don't do any. Unless you know the exact extension to connect to, you can't get anything, which is really good, which is really, really good. And it was funny because Brad came in the class the next day and said, all right, one of you called my work. Who was it? Because yeah, because they their policy is you give out no information about anybody, unless they call in and say I need to talk to Brad at extension one two three. You ain't getting nothing. So kind of funny at the same place it was. And this is that restaurant chain. I went to Garfield's. The restaurant had really really bad service. And I'm one of those if I get really bad service I'm going to tell someone about it. But I also tell people about good service. I had some really lousy service. So I went online to their website. To complain. They had a complaint area on the website, and I filled out a big old long complaint and submitted it. And Brad comes in the next, he calls me the next day, next morning. He's like, Kent, did you fill out a complaint for Garfield's at Crossroads Bonus? He says, yeah. He's like, well, turns out that someone got the complaint and was sitting in the back where Brad worked and said, we well, got a complaint for this Ken Dewey guy. Does anyone know him? Brad's like, Ken Dewey? From Rose State College? Yeah. Because you need to take care of that right away because he's going to tell the entire world. <laughs> I tell you what, I'd say within two hours, the manager of that restaurant had driven to Roche State and handed me $50 in coupons oh, wow. or gift card, whatever, gift certificates. He says, you need to take care of it because he's going to tell everybody. <laughs> <laughs> They're out of business now, but Macaroni Grill isn't, but Garfield is close to going out of business. All right, so it's a small group of attackers approach the door of a building, pretend to have lost their key. Let in by a friendly employee. It happens all the time. You're going to stand there. Even though those doors that buzz, you can stand there and wait till somebody else goes through. Then walk in behind them. Okay? Uh, actually, it happens at the gyms I take care of. Because they got, you know, you, you put your fob by the door and the door unlock. Then you go through. And the way those systems work, when you swipe your fob, it disengages the tailgate system for like 10 seconds. And unlocks the door. And dis that way you can walk through with your bag or whatever. But someone can follow in behind you. There's a big notice there. If you get caught doing that, you're going to charge a fine and all this stuff. Me, I, could, I just walk through it. I could care because they see me on the camera and they know who I am. But it could happen anywhere, okay? All right. Uh, group had learned CFO was out of town because of his voicemail greeting. Yeah. Let's see, I emailed Shalon yesterday. I got a message back saying I'm out of town. 
I mean, I hope we do that. I always. Uh, break ins A friend of mine did that on Facebook. He's like, all right, heading to wherever. See you in a week. So I reply back, great. What's your address now? And he's like, point well taken. Thank you. Yeah. I don't mind posting pictures, but I usually like to post them after the fact. So, yeah. All right. Oh, missed one. All right. Um, okay, so they entered the CFO. They gathered in information about it, went through the trash. I mean, we have cleaning crews everywhere. The way our cleaning crew works at our campus, I don't know how yours does it, but at our campus, when we all go home at night, say 930, we lock all our doors. At 10 o'clock, security lets the cleaning crew in. Security unlocks every single door. They open every door and prop every door open. The cleaning crew cleans the whole building. Then they shut all the doors and leave. Is that probably what happens here? Probably happens in multiple places. So what are they getting access to? Everything. Every office, every computer system. So could be bad. Could be tough. Okay. So people call, pretend to be the CFO, ask for the password to be urgent. You ever have that where certain people get VIP status? At Tinker, if you're a colonel above, you're considered a VIP. Whenever a help desk ticket comes in, yeah, you talked about it in the last class, but whenever a help desk ticket comes in for a VIP, what happens? People jump over hoops to help them. You, you, you baby them. Yeah, but if you call to pretend to be one of them, it's, it's crazy. It can happen. Because, like, okay, well, we're, like at Rose State, the policy is if you forget your password and you need them to reset it, you must go up there with ID in hand to prove who you are. But I can guarantee you if I called and said, my name is Dr. Terry Britton, the president of Rose State College, I'm at home, can't get in, you think they could be saying, sorry, drive up here. <laughs> if they would believe my voice, they'd be resetting the password. So, you know, it would. I mean, it's just, a, it's human nature. Okay? All right. All right, uh, impersonation, you could pretend to be a help desk person. We talked about that already. Could be a repair person. Could be a trusted third party. You know, I got I said, a guy installing a roof on my house yesterday and today. I hired a company to do it. Do you actually think that company's doing it? No. They all hired out to everybody else. I actually messaged them about 8 o'clock last night. So I looked on my backyard camera. There was so much trash and crap all in my yard. I messaged them and said, dude, I have three young kids living in my house. There's nails and crap all over. He's like, it will be cleaned up before we leave today. I said, it better. Because that's a problem waiting to happen. Okay. But they hire contractors who work for him to do the work on my house. I don't know who they are. So, all right. All right. Phishing could be an email claiming for legitimate source. Happens all the time. Actually, I got one today. No, it was last night. It was an email saying... It was from somewhere out of overseas, so I knew it wasn't legit. It basically says, your email has reached its maximum. We are now, whatever, rejecting your emails. Please click here to auto-unlock or some crap. Your account's full of whatever. I don't know what it was. But I wonder how many people clicked on that. I don't know. I didn't. Okay. Okay, it could be farming. Automatically redirects users to fraudulent websites. Maybe it's not going to where it's supposed to be. Okay. Spear phishing, email matches targeting specific users. We had, um, we, we participated in a study um, with Oak Ridge Laboratories about uh, click rates on spear phishing mm -hmm. attacks. So we send out spear phishing attacks and right. demographics to see, um, you know, how effective our teaching, uh, our awareness training is. Right. And, um, yeah, there's, there's plenty of that stuff going on out there. And it says going after the big fish, maybe we want people with money. Okay. Going after the older people who don't know better, that kind of stuff. Okay, Or voice veil says, attackers call victims with recorded blank messages with a callback number. Now, someone was posting on Facebook the other day, hey, I keep getting a call from this number, and I answer it, and they don't talk. <laughs> well, it could be, you know, a long distance, who knows what it could be, but all right. All right, here's a phishing email. We've all seen them, the eBay emails and all them, or the Nigerian scam emails, that kind of stuff, okay? Ways to recognize phishing. Deceptive web links. If you look at the links, but now we have the whole tiny URL thing, so those are tough. So it's hard to read it. Variations of legitimate, look at them closely. 
is it really from the US or is it .com or .something else instead? Okay, presence of vendor logos that look legitimate, could be a fake address, urgent requests, that happens a lot. You must do this immediately or your email will be deleted or some crap was the one yesterday. So I think I deleted it. Okay, spam could be unsolicited, okay, for malware sent to everybody. It's a lucrative business. There's a lot of money in it, okay? Could be instant messaging spam or spam, they call it, okay? Could be image. Instead of the word Viagra, now we have the picture of the word Viagra, which is tough, okay? That way they get around the text-based filters, okay? But it still has text in it. It still has text, usually, because a lot of times if there's no text, it won't let it through either, right. so. Uh, I don't know if I told you all this, but I was telling um, uh, not Amazon. Google's doing a new deal now that if you send an email to somebody saying, okay, I'm attaching whatever, yet it doesn't detect an attachment, it actually notifies you. Pops up and says, hey, you, looks like you're sending an attachment. You didn't include one. I think that's awesome. Because I'm always saying, okay, I'm going to send it and I never attach it. Then I get an email, uh, Ken, you never sent the file to me. So I think that's awesome they're starting to do that. Okay. GIF laying could be multiple images so it's not one big piece there's all kinds of the or word splitting you know back when i ran my isp i would try to do content filtering on viagra i must have had a thousand different spellings and would still get through it's tough it's nearly impossible okay geometric variance is just all kinds of you know no two emails look the same oh there's viagra it's a picture of it okay yeah that's why in email now uh, like they default to not showing the images which is kind of good, so we get away from all this, okay? Hoaxes, false warning or, warning or claim, okay? That could be, the, hey, your email is going to get rejected or something, okay? Java bear. What? Yeah, the Java bear, exactly. Dumpster diving, digging through trash. We had our students, I've done this many times, having to do dumpster diving around the city, and one of my students went to Express Personnel, the staffing company, and brought back a whole pile of time cards with social security numbers and everything on them. So I called them. I called the number, and it was actually the headquarters number, and I said, hey, Ken Dewey from school, I had some students doing a project, and they brought me a bunch of your time cards. So no, they didn't. I said, yes, they did. I have them right here. They says, sir, we have a shredding policy that all those get shredded. I said, I don't know, but I have them in my hand. She goes, if you have them, there'll be a number in the corner. So I read off the number. She's like, oh, those are from corporate. I'm like, all I know is we got them. Okay, uh, up at University of Tulsa, they had a project where the students had to do dumpster diving around the city. Someone happened to go to a tag agency and um, basically brought back a bunch of the cellophane film. That's what was in the trash. A whole bunch of cellophane film, blue, yellow, and red. What it was is a new driver's license in Oklahoma, full color, and they print on these printers with a cellophane ribbon. Well, we got this new driver's license to prevent theft. The problem was the ribbon they're throwing away. You hold it up to the light, see the exact image of the driver's license. So it's pretty scary. Um, another thing um, we've done uh, was kind of funny. What if I was to go to your trash can, probably most of you, and pull out your old medicine bottles? What if I was to call you and say, hey, you know, hey, Shalon Simmons, this is Ken from Walgreens Pharmacy. I see you just refilled XYZ drug. You'd be like, yeah, because if you throw it away, you probably just refilled it. Well, I'm filing your insurance claim, and it's getting rejected. Could you please verify your social security number? What are the odds? See, I know enough about you now that you can be like, oh, my God, I can't pay that 400 bucks. You're going to give it to me. Way back in the mid-'90s, I worked at the alert facility at Tinker, okay, uh, way to the far side of Tinker Air Force Base. And we had two phones. Remember, we're talking in the mid-90s. It wasn't cell phones. We had two phones, one at one end of the building, one at the other end. And what we would do is we'd get to the far end of the building, and we had this guy who would call the phone and, you know, call the other end of the building. And they'd be like, Ken, you got a message. We had to walk our butt all the way over the other end of the building. And he'd oh, I made you walk over here for nothing. He used to drive us crazy. Well, one day he went to the hospital and came back and put all his medicines on top of the cabinet. I called my wife and told her what they were. She called the phone, and Airman, whatever his name was, said, hey, this is so-and-so from the hospital. You just saw a doctor or whatever. Yeah, 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 and you got your medicines. He goes, yeah, I got them all. 
well, did you take them yet? He's like, yeah, you told me to take them immediately. She's like, I need you to hang up the phone and go right to the emergency room. He's like, what? She goes, did you take the medicines? He says, yes. She's like, hang up the phone, go directly to the emergency room. You were given the wrong medicine. The dude was freaking out and screaming and yelling, and we were laughing so hard. He was so pissed that he never, ever did another stunt. What? Did you let him go all the way to the no, I mean, think about it. They would have sent an ambulance for him, first of all. <laughs> yeah, they wouldn't want you driving. Hop in a car. <laughs> drive a car. <laughs> but he wasn't thinking straight at that time. <laughs> but he wasn't thinking straight. But the fact is we knew enough information about him. So I just tell people, you know, like, your medicine bottles, I don't know if you all realize those labels come right off. Put them on a credit card application and shred them. So, you know. It's just funny. So dumpster diving, you get all kinds of information in there. Tailgating, we talked about that earlier, following someone behind an access door. Okay. So even this room here, you know, they've been unlocking this door for me every morning. I don't know what time they unlock it. I'm glad they are because I need to get in here. But what if someone's been noticing that at 740 the door's been open and no one's in here? They could run in and grab something and leave. I mean, don't tell them to lock it. Okay, please. I want to get in here this week. But you can see how that could happen. Even in our building at Rose State, they unlock all the lecture rooms every morning. Even during spring break, Easter holiday, ever. It's, I, there's really no common sense. The rules say open the doors Monday through Friday. They don't take into account that the school's closed. But they open them, and even though they're a lecture room, there's still one computer in it. That one computer could get stolen. So, all right. So, just different things you can get, calendars, inexpensive hardware, memos, just all kinds of stuff you can get out of the dumpster. Phone directories, manuals, system manuals, just all kinds, okay? All right, someone can say, please hold the door for me, I got a package. That's an example of tailgating. Wait outside until someone else goes in. Right. It says, employee conspires with unauthorized persons to walk together through the open door. I've brought people to the gym before with me. And what I tell them is, okay, as soon as I swipe my thing and open the door, walk through with me. Because I know it has a 10-second time period where that door is, you know, the tailgate's off. And it doesn't even go off. Okay. All right. Okay. Shoulder surfing, watching what people are typing. Um, in the Oklahoma City Airport, I've been through it about 100,000 times, they got the little keypad on the doors to the gates. Now, right when you're sitting at your gate, I've been impressed lately. You go there and watch them. They go over there and they huddle around it and cover it up and type in the coach. You can't see what they're doing. That's awesome. That's what should happen. But I've seen so many times at other places, they don't. I used to take care of a law firm up on the 34th floor of the Oklahoma Tower in Oklahoma City. They had a door just like you guys got here, a five-button door. Well, the code was always three consecutive numbers. It was like one, two, three, then change it to two, three, four, then three, four, five. Then 451, then 512. It was always three consecutive numbers. How long would that take to guess? Because they would, you know, they'd be like, oh, Ken, we forgot to give you the code. I'm like, I don't need it. I got in. Because it was always three consecutive numbers. So. I remember, like, last October when Anonymous posted all of those passwords and for, like, I can't remember yeah. Verizon. It's one of the cell phones. Yeah, they put a whole bunch of them, yes. They were all, like, one, two, three, yeah. four, three, well, two. What was recently that? President of some foreign country, his password was one two three four five. Yeah, it was a Syria. Yeah, it was Syria. Syria. Was it? Yeah. It was one two three four five, wasn't yeah, it? Or something like that. It was something really easy. Yeah, so many people use those. It's just crazy. The word password, or yeah, you know, there was actually just recently there's an article about, after the Yahoo stealing about the most common. It's like you know NC one seven zero one, which is the Star Trek designation, is a big one. But they had all these passwords. Like wow, I would never. <laughs> But, right, a lot of people have those. They have the word password. There's seen like 75%. These are all executives. And it was right during that whole um, issue with the movie industry and um, right. you know, what was going before Congress. And that's whenever they posted them. Nice. Like 75% of them were either 1234 or 4331. Oh, like executives. They posted their cell phone numbers, their passwords. Everything. I think what, you know, what I think is crazy, ATM cards, we all have one. It's a four-digit pin. Numerical only. I hate that. But that's everybody uses that. So it's like, why? I don't know if it'll ever change. I just think it's very unsecure. Especially when 
you know, I drive up to an ATM, I reach out of my window to put in the code. I could be sitting over there with some binoculars and getting it very easily. But oh well, I keep mentioning that, no one ever fixes it. All right, that's the end of this chapter. All right, let me stop the recording. We had a situation at. Uh,